Chinese President Xi Jinping calls the relationship between his country and Russia the best among major nations of the world. Trade between China and Russia is growing rapidly, and the two have found themselves politically aligned on Syria and Iran. So joining us now to discuss what the Sino-Russian relationship means for geopolitics is Gordon Chang. He is the author of The Coming Collapse of China and a columnist at Forbes.com. Welcome back to the agenda. Thank you so much. Okay, we are talking about the governments of the, you know, huge bulk of the population of the world. How do you characterize, I want to step back, how, how do you characterize relationship between China and Russia in the Cold War period, post-World War II to the early 90s? It was really good and really bad. When the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949, Mao Zedong looked to the Soviets as his big brother, and the relationship was really good. And the Chinese wanted to be like the Soviet Union. But you get to the time when Khrushchev gets, gets into power, relationships between Moscow and Beijing get really bad. They have a seven-month shooting war in 1969 over their border. And so, you know, the United States, Nixon in particular, sees this as an opportunity. Nixon goes to Beijing in 1972, and basically China switches sides in the Cold War. And this is really important. But now what we are seeing is China switching sides again, moving away from the United States, more towards Russia. We're going to talk about this, this flip-flop, if I can put it that way, of, of China and the reasons for it. And one of the things that happened last year is the Chinese president, uh, Xi Jinping, makes, goes off to Russia's first maiden voyage as the new president. What should we read into that? Well, that's very important because from a Chinese perspective, the first countries that a Chinese leader goes to are the ones that are considered the most important from Beijing's point of view. So going to Russia clearly was a signal to everybody that really China and Russia had started to cement a relationship. There's a lot of reasons why these two countries don't like each other and have had problems in the past. But right now, we're seeing those reasons start to disappear because these two countries, in, in very way, many ways, they view themselves in the same term. They see their interests converging. They are, in fact, working together. And they are like-minded. So this is really important. So beyond, this is not just a symbolic relationship. This has real meat to it. I think that we're getting to that point. Because one of the things that we see is that Putin is starting to view that his Russia is really weaker than he had hoped. You know, when he saw Russia as being like one of the major countries in the world, he gave the Chinese a difficult time. But now he sees that he needs China very much. Um, and so he's becoming very accommodating. And the Chinese now think they probably can control Putin. So this is a very important thing. Okay, so Putin needs China, in your right. estimation. Does China need Putin? I mean, is this a mutually beneficial relationship? I think that the Chinese uh, at this point sort of see themselves as the senior partner. But in many ways, China has hit an inflection point, And it's, I, I believe, on a downward slide, especially when you see you get accelerated demographic decline, just like in Russia. You've got environmental problems that are very serious, social tensions. But most important, you see an economy that's not growing at the 7.7% that they claim. It's probably going, growing 2 or 3% or whatever. But they've got an enormous debt issue. And I think the Chinese, when these problems become more manifest, I think the Chinese are going to see that they need Russia, just as Russia needs China. And that's why I think this partnership is going to be enduring. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, the economics and the breakdown of that in a minute. But I, I, in this relationship, I mean, these are two heavy hitters, the leaders as well as the countries. Yeah. I mean, who's wearing the pants in this relationship? <laughs> well, uh, the, Xi Jinping is wearing the pants right now. And, and we saw this with this tie-up uh, where the Chinese have now gotten an equity stake in a gas field in eastern Siberia. This is a major deal. And so it's going to be important because the Chinese have had a lot of interest in eastern Siberia. You have a lot of Chinese migrating into a very sparsely dense, uh, sparsely populated area. You have Chinese economic interests now starting to predominate in Siberia. The Russians are very afraid of this. But nonetheless, they gave, um, you know, a Chinese state oil company a major interest in a Russian energy field. So this They've is They've never done that before. They did that in 2006, but on a very small scale. The deal that we saw last October, last September, was really very important. Uh, so we got, you know, a um, state, uh, state gas company in, in Russia now making a relationship with a Chinese state oil company. This is really important stuff. Okay. Um, I want to look a little bit about how these two countries are connected economically, because you referred to that in a general sense. But let's break this down. Okay. In Russia, uh, 2012, GDP grows by 3.5%. Comparatively, China's grows by 7.8%. In 2012, it's come down uh, since then. Um, Russia is selling to China things like military, uh, space technology, energy, oil, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Russia, 
China is selling to Russia what it sells to, to the rest of the world, and that's consumer goods. Right. Last 20 years, bilateral exchange between these two countries has been multiplied by 14. The countries, Russia and China, have a target of 77.5 billion euros of bilateral trade by 2015. Okay, 77.5 billion euros bilateral trade by 2015. Gordon Chang, how much do these countries, how dependent are they on, on each other economically? Well, I think China is still much more dependent on the United States, uh, for instance. You know, last year, um, about 122% of China's overall trade surplus related to sales to the U.S. That's incredible. So China's surplus against the U.S. was much bigger than its overall surplus. So this really shows a dependence on the United States. And of course, its dependence on, on Western Europe is also big. But nonetheless, you see a lot of growth in the China-Russia uh, the China -Russia trade relationship. And what's important is many people are starting to think that the Russians are going to start selling the crown jewels of their military, of their arsenal. They haven't done that before. They've sort of sold second line equipment. But now many people are starting to think that because this tie up is really becoming uh, cemented, that the Russians are going to start selling really top of the line fighters and submarines. This is going to be a problem for us. Well they might need them, both countries, because they've both got territorial d disputes. China with Japan o over that, that set of islands. Russia disputing with its former Soviet uh, countries. So the strained relations, each of them has them with, the immediate, with their immediate neighbors. How does, does that play into these two big super behemoths coming together? Well, it was very interesting that at the end of last year, Xi Jinping invited the Russians to help the Chinese guarantee peace and security in East Asia. Um, now, a lot of other countries would not think that that's a good development because, you know, China not only has territorial disputes with Japan, it has territorial disputes with India, the six or seven nations on the South China Sea, and with South Korea. So you have this arc of instability with India in the south to South Korea in the north. China is trying to grab territory, sometimes using forceful tactics. Now, I don't think the Russians really want to become a part of that. But Xi Jinping might sort of drag them in. And, and this would not be good if we have to face not just China, which would be bad enough, but also China and Russia. Because this is an axis, you know, an axis of gigantic states. Who knows? But it's going to be really tough for us. And, of course, Russia currently, its dispute with Ukraine right now, um, you know, also trying to say, hey, I, I'm, the, I'm the big guy here. You'll right. stay under my thumb. So both of them fighting on that front. But you talked about the military spending. So both these countries, again, putting lots and lots of their own money into the development of their own militaries and, and growing for the first time in five years. On the other side of the world, in the West, we have countries, the United States namely, where we're, you know, time of austerity, drawing down on military um, uh, spending. So what's going on here? There's these two countries over there, if I can put it that way, spending right. lots. We're not spending as much. We're drawing down. They're outfitting their army so rapidly. Why? So rapidly, why? Well, I think part of the reason why in China is because the Chinese military has become very, very powerful within the political system. You have a political system which is probably in distress. Um, you have Xi Jinping trying to consolidate his position. He needs the flag officers because the People's Liberation Army is the most powerful faction inside the Communist Party. And Xi Jinping is not in a position to tell the generals and admirals no. So when it comes to spending, those guys are going to get a lot of the budget. Um, and that's going to continue. You know, they say that they're going to spend $148 billion. No, they're going to spend, you know, somewhere upwards of $300 billion in all probability. There's a lot we don't know about Chinese military spending. But it is big. It's growing fast. It's probably growing faster than the economy, which is the important thing. And the question is, how long can this continue? But in the interim, though, the flag officers are really very politically potent. And that's why they get to say it, have a big say in, in China's foreign policies. And Russia is spending uh, on its own military at the same time. So if I'm President Obama sitting at the White House, seeing this going on, am I worried? Well, he should be worried. Um, you know, I'm not so worried about the Russians. I mean, they've got big plans for their military. But their economy last year grew by 1.3%. Putin is on record as saying that for Russia to achieve its ambitions, it has to grow at at least at 5.0 percent. People were just stunned at how slow growth is in Russia. And industrial production in Russia last year grew by 0.3 percent. So the Russians cannot afford their ambitions. I think eventually the Chinese will not be able to afford theirs either because they've got an enormous debt crisis, which they have yet to deal with. 
So I think that in long term, China is in, in trouble, but not now. But I, I, on the one hand, you know, Russia has this great resource, one of the top oil producing nations in the world. China, top consumer of oil. I mean, doesn't right. that make the relationship more enduring or having more potential? It, it should. Uh, and we probably are going to see more oil and gas deals between the two countries. They're having some problems in terms of, of trying to come to terms on some of the specifics of their deals. But they will do that because China does see that its needs for hydrocarbons are going to increase. So this is something which is sort of a natural fit between the two countries. Okay. So that's the economic side, though. I want to shift to the political one. These two are in lockstep over some pretty thorny uh, foreign policy issues, and I want to go through some of them. Syria, you're on the same page. Oh, well, they're certainly on the same page. Both China and Russia um, used their vetoes three times uh, on the Syrian issue in the UN Security Council. They were working together. Uh, last year, we saw both Russian and Chinese vessels in the eastern Mediterranean, which is really a warning to the United States Navy and NATO vessels in the area. So this was a real wake-up sign, um, a wake-up call for us. Um, so they're working very, very closely on Syria. And if they work very closely on Syria, they're going to be working very closely on Syria's best friend, which is... Iran. Iran, <laughs> of course. And, and that's really much more of a problem for us because Iran is very close to a nuclear weapon. Um, we have yet to be able to figure out how to stop the Iranians. And at the same time, China is backing both Iran and North Korea. And this is important because Iran and North Korea has essentially got a joint program on the development of nukes as well as long-range ballistic missiles. So we have China in the background supporting two rogue states. And are China and uh, Russia in the exact same similar position when it comes to North Korea? I mean, we hear a lot about where China is, yeah. obviously, but... Um, I think Russia on, on North Korea w could exercise a lot of influence because, uh, for instance, when Kim Jong-il was around, he really liked Putin, and he didn't like the Chinese counterparts that he was dealing with. But Russia has really spent much more time on the Ukraines, what they call the near abroad, and they have not spent very much time looking at their Far East. So they've sort of just abandoned almost their position that they could exercise of influence with regard to North Korea, with regard to East Asia. And they've let sort of China do that. And that's a sign, I think, that Russia really sees its position as weak. Okay, I want to read something. This is, uh, was written in uh, the Washington Post back in December uh, by Ann Applebaum. I want to read you some of this. Here's what she wrote. The elites of both these countries, China and Russia, do have one thing in common. They dislike the institutions of liberal democracy as practiced in Europe, the United States, Japan, and elsewhere. And they are determined to prevent them from spreading to Moscow or Beijing. These same elites believe that Western media, Western ideas, and especially Western capitalism, as opposed to state capitalism, pose a threat to their personal domination of their economies. They want the world to remain safe for their particular form of authoritarian oligarchy, and they are increasingly prepared to pay a high price for it. Gordon Cech, I mean, that could have been written during the Cold War, almost. Yeah, you know, Ann Applebaum um, says there's no Cold War, but then, you know, in her column... She, we should just explain. She's always, she says, that's a question I'm always asked, is, is this a new Cold War? And I say no. Yeah, but she has this column, which was a really excellent one, and when you read it, you say, this is the Cold War. <laughs> now, I don't care what you call it, but clearly you do see China and Russia cooperating on a range of issues, and those issues, you know, they are obstructing what the rest of the international community wants to do. So I don't think you have to label it, but you do have to be concerned because you do have two very big states that um, oppose most of what the rest of the world wants. I guess the argument to, to label it the new Cold War or, or something like that is because... Um, it depends on a shared ideology. Do, I mean, do China and Russia now in 2014, are, are they the same, coming from the same perspective ideologically? You know, I don't think the Russian people are, and I don't even think the Chinese people are. You know, in, if you go to Russia today, you see, um, you see all sorts of things that you didn't see under communism, like the churches and all the rest of it. And, and there really has been a flowering of Russian society. But at the top, you know, you have a political system dominated by one man. And so that one man really wants to have a good relationship with China. And that's why you see this growing relationship, which I think is sort of like an axis almost. Um, but you don't, I don't think you see Russians as a whole buying into what the Chinese are buying into. You know, you do have two authoritarian systems, but Russia is more, much more softer authoritarianism. So I think you have a merging of the elites, as Ann Applebaum talks about. But for the Chinese people and the Russian people, they don't want a part of that.
Okay, so at the beginning of our conversation, you said that you see this relationship as I think the word you used was lasting. And my question is, how long does it last? I mean, does this, is this, are we going to be talking about the Sino-Russian relationship being healthy and, and prosperous in terms of relationship next year, five years from now, 10 years from now? Well, certainly next year, it's, it's going to be healthy because you're going to see Xi Jinping and, and Vladimir Putin really cooperate on, on, for instance, the Iran issue, which is coming up, North Korea, which is going to be an issue, I think, this year. So I, I do see that they are going to work much closer together. You know, 10 years out, who knows what's going to happen? Um, I think that we are going to see great changes in the political system in China in 10 years. So we won't have to deal with a Xi Jinping or a Communist Party. But until, you know, as long as those guys are there, um, they will see that their interests do very much coincide with the Russian interest as long as Putin is there. So I think that this is a personal relationship. As long as those two guys are there, it's going to be a tight one. We're having this conversation in the Western media, something that, according to Anne Applebaum, the Chinese or the Russians don't have much respect for. But I do ask this question, what about our governments in the West? I mean, are they paying enough attention to this at this point? I think they're paying attention, but they're using an incorrect conceptual framework. You know, we have the theory that everyone in the world should get along, um, you know, and, and to the extent that we think that the great powers have, you know, more sway. You know, it's like Condoleezza Rice saying, well, you know, we can all sit down in a room and settle this. The problem is that you have China and Russia with very different perspectives than Europeans, you know, North Americans, the Japanese. And, and the problem is that they just see the world differently. Um, they have a very different concept of what they want to get done. And so I think that this is a problem. And we have to understand that, call it Cold War, call it whatever you want. Um, there is a very sharp difference of opinion, which is going to manifest itself in policies. And, and that difference of uh, the, the approach, I guess, it, on the one hand, you know, Western leaders kind of see things, as you say, get along, at least be collaborative, whereas it appears, it, it seems that the Chinese and the Russians sort of say, okay, little little states, we're going to work together, you don't have a choice, I, I'm going to control you. Is, is that where you see the difference? Well, yeah, I mean, clearly uh, Putin's foreign policy and Xi Jinping's are very much that way, where they are dictating to their neighbors. Um, you know, and the part of China, we're seeing some very aggressive actions to actually seize territory, which they did from the Philippines in 2012. You know, they had this new air defense identification zone, which intended to exercise really jurisdiction over the airspace of South Korea and Japan. Um, they now have these new rules trying to control the South China Sea, which is international water. So these are very serious challenges to the whole concept of freedom of navigation and an open commons. I guess a lot of people might suggest that the, that the West does the same thing, sort of tell smaller states what to do, the big powers do anyway. I think it's very, very different. I mean, you don't see, for instance, Germany taking parts of Poland, um, and, and which is what China is doing. And so, you know, there's some very aggressive things that are going on. And, and Putin, of course, has, has exercised some pretty tough tactics. You know, all countries will use their national power, but countries, especially these days, do see limits on what they can do, and the Chinese don't see those limits. And I don't think the Russians do as well, you know, or at least Putin doesn't. And, and Putin is willing to go along with the ride, so that's the problem. Gordon Chang, always great to have you in. Thank you for your analysis once again. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.